Judy Garland was undoubtedly a brilliant presence on screen. From her breakthrough performance in The Wizard of Oz to her later blockbusters, Like a Star is Born. Sadly, she had a life full of sorrow. All of the horrible things that happened to her would dominate any faithful biography of the talented but tragic actress. Behind the scenes of her legendary screen career were the dysfunctional parents, the studio abusers, early exposure to drugs and alcohol, and a series of unsuccessful marriages. All of that laid the foundation for an all-too-young passing, as she departed at the age of only 47. Garland was undoubtedly a victim of the terrible world of old Hollywood, but she seemed powerless to escape the vicious cycle of bad relationships and financial ruin that ultimately destroyed her life and career. As Dorothy Gale, she was able to successfully make it back home, to a house filled with love and stability. Sadly, in the real world, she would never be able to truly make it over the rainbow, as detailed in the 2019 biographical film Judy. Here are some of the scandalous and heartbreaking aspects of the life of Judy Garland. Her childhood was dominated by her ambitious stage mom. Judy Garland was born Frances Ethel Gum in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, on June 10, 1922. She almost wasn't born at all. Her mother, who at the time had two children, first discussed the possibility of having an abortion with doctors, but they advised her to abort the child instead. Mrs. Gum, a dissatisfied vaudevillian, put little Frances on stage when she was only two and a half years old, adding her to an act with her two sisters. The Gums relocated to Lancaster, California, when Frances was four years old. Ethel wanted to get her children as close as possible to the film and entertainment center of Los Angeles. Later, the actress thought back to her mother as the real Wicked Witch of the West. Her parents had an unhappy marriage of convenience. Frances's father, Frank Gum, was also a vaudevillian. His marriage to his wife cemented their song and dance duo, if nothing else. But as biographies have detailed, Gum apparently identified as bisexual and started making sexual approaches on the teenage male helpers and students that attended the family-owned movie theater. According to some sources, the rumors of Gum's affinities were what ultimately drove the family to move to California. Young Frances was hurt by her parents' troubled relationship. She later said, As I recall, my parents were separating and getting back together all the time. It was very hard for me to understand those things, and of course, I remember clearly the fear I had of those separations. Shortly after Garland signed with MGM, her father passed away in 1935. She was forced to diet and modify her body to appear childlike. The Gum sisters decided to change their names after moving to California. How this actually occurred is a subject of debate, but the trio became the Garland sisters and Frances picked the name Judy. In 1935, 13-year-old Judy Garland signed her first contract with MGM. Because Garland was more wholesome than the studio's bombshells, she was given roles that perpetuated a childish, teenaged appearance. She appeared alongside Mickey Rooney in a number of well-known and lucrative films, and the studio demanded that she maintain an immature appearance for as long as possible. She was forced to constantly diet and her chest was bound to keep her looking less developed. Throughout this process, her mom, who served as both her guardian and manager, was quite comfortable with the studio's abusive control of Garland's physical appearance. Studio head Louis Mayer referred to her as his little hunchback. Louis Mayer, the autocratic head of MGM Studios, openly referred to Garland as, My little hunchback is enough but Mayer also regularly harassed the star, touching her aggressively while telling her that she sung from the heart. When Garvin finally questioned him about this behavior, Mayer seemed to be shocked and said he felt like a father to her. Mayer also helped to maintain Garland's youth as much as possible, even if that required taping down her chest, fitting her with a painful corset to squeeze into her Wizard of Oz dress, 
and continually assigning her parts that were well below her age. All of this did not improve Garland's mental health, and in 1950, MGM fired her due to her neuroses and stubbornness. She had to smoke and take drugs while filming The Wizard of Oz. Garland made her film debut in MGM's Technicolor Fantasy, The Wizard of Oz in 1939 at the age of 17. Despite the fact that this movie catapulted Garland to popularity, she paid a very high personal price. MGM management were particularly strict in their ongoing efforts to control the actress's physical appearance and diet due to the concentrated focus on this significant production. Garland had minders who snatched plates of food from her at the studio commissary, and she was encouraged to keep to a diet of black coffee and as many as 80 cigarettes a day. Garland was also given a variety of stimulant and depressive drugs to help her complete the movie and a demanding promotional road tour with Mickey Rooney. This practice likely kick-started the substance abuse problem that perpetually plagued her and ultimately led to her demise. You might think that her co-stars would support her, but even they are said to have ignored and isolated her. They were adults who didn't want to be upstaged by a teenage actress who was getting the star treatment as well. Her first marriage was an ill-fated escape attempt from her mother. Between dealing with harassment and ridicule from studio executives, hostility toward her domineering mother, and a belief that having a husband would shield her from all of the various bullies in her life, 19-year-old Garland decided to get married to band leader David Rose. Despite ultimatums from both her mother and Louis Mayer, who both disliked the idea of the public, no longer being able to perceive Garland as a young and innocent waif. Garland went through with the marriage on July 28, 1941. Garland unexpectedly became pregnant, but Rose convinced her to have an abortion with the help of a few other people. After barely eight months of separation, Garland and Rose got a divorce in 1944. She found her second husband in bed with another man. Rumors that Vicente Minnelli lived an openly gay lifestyle in New York were swept under the rug in Los Angeles since it was considered unacceptable in the mainstream film industry. Garland met Minnelli, her second husband, when he directed her at Meet Me in St. Louis, a film that finally allowed Garland to appear as an attractive woman rather than a gawky child. They got married on June 15, 1945. Garland and Minnelli had a daughter named Lisa, but their relationship struggled due to Garland's unpredictable personality, drug usage, and 20-year age difference. Then, in 1948, upon arriving home, Judy discovered her husband lovingly embracing their male employee. In response, she rushed to the bathroom and attempted to cut her wrists. Before she could really damage herself, Minnelli arrived. The couple separated in 1949 and officially divorced in 1951. Her third husband drank and gambled away most of her money. Garland's career was on the decline when she first met Sidney Luft, a tough New Yorker working on the fringe of the film industry. In 1952, the couple was married and Luft became Garland's manager. Their collaboration produced the well-received A Star Is Born a movie that revitalized Garland's career and earned her an Oscar nomination. Garland ultimately lost out to the country girls Grace Kelly and Warner Bros. terminated Luft's production deal, which called for Garland to appear in two further films. Things weren't easy at home, either. Most of Garland's big earnings were lost to Luft's compulsive gambling and drinking. In 1960, she finally filed for divorce after finding she was bankrupt. In 1993, Luft tried to sell Garland's 1939 honorary Oscar and the replacement statuette she had received after claiming the first one disappeared. The Academy took Luft to court, and he was forced to pay $60,000 in damages. Her fourth husband slept with her daughter's husband. Garland already had a history of getting involved with gay men. When she started dating Mark Heron, the couple married in Las Vegas in November of 1965. 
despite Heron's openly gay relationship with another actor. Lisa Minnelli, Judy's daughter, eventually found Heron in bed with her husband, Peter Allen, a musician. Unofficially, Heron and Garland separated after five months. Garland was granted a divorce in 1967. Heron returned to his male companion, with whom he lived for the next 25 years. She was shunned by her daughter. As Garland's drug abuse problems grew worse in the 1950s and 1960s, her teenage daughter, Lisa Minnelli, had to essentially manage the household and the other, younger children. Minnelli saved her mother's life on several occasions, preventing drug overdoses and once even physically restraining Garland from jumping out of a hotel window. According to Gerald Clark's biography of the actress, Get Happy. As a successful adult, Minnelli quickly became tired of helping her mother, both financially and emotionally. When Garland called, she dropped the call and even specifically banned her mother from entering her Manhattan apartment building. When Garland called the front desk, the doorman would brusquely inform her that Miss Minnelli is not accepting any calls from her mother. She threw a knife at her son. After Lisa Minnelli got married and began to establish her own career, the job of being Garland's full-time caretaker fell to her younger daughter, Lorna Luft. Luft recalled talking her mother down from suicide threats and the difficulty of managing a parent with addiction issues as severe as her mother's. Once, Garland even hurled a knife at her son, Luft's younger brother Joey. Luft blamed her mother's behavior to a serious drug addiction in which Ritalin and amphetamines were consumed at 20 times the normal dosage. At the age of 16, Luft ultimately left her mother because she was unable to handle her demanding and controlling parenting. She was fired from Valley of the Dolls. Garland signed a deal with 20th Century Fox in February 1967 to play Helen Lawson in the film adaptation of Valley of the Dolls. The character was an older woman with a nasty temper. Although Garland was able to get through wardrobe tests and pre-recorded a song, trouble started when the filming of the movie began in March of 1967. With some sources claiming Garland was never really comfortable with the role or the film, because she refused to leave her dressing room. Whatever the reason, by the end of April 1967, Garland's career was terminated in front of a large audience, and he was given a $37,500 settlement, half of her intended salary. She got a book contract in 1960, but never finished the manuscript. In 1959, Garland was recuperating from hepatitis and cirrhosis of the liver in a Manhattan hospital when she was visited by Random House editor Bennett Cerf. He offered her a $35,000 contract for her autobiography, a memoir that she promised would be a frank and open tell-all about her turbulent career and emotional life. She made it through 65 pages of tape recordings before returning to Los Angeles, but the book was never completed. In 1966, desperate for a payday, Garland approached Random House, hoping to rekindle the deal. The publishing house declined the offer. The $35,000 was long gone, like most of her assets at the time. She was essentially destitute and homeless in her last years. By 1968, Garland had turned her back on her kids, her co-workers, and pretty much everyone who could have offered her professional support. She was so destitute that she was forced to prevail upon fans, who would take her in and let her sleep on the couch, her possessions stored in a couple of paper shopping bags. John Mayer, one of these people, was able to secure her some gigs in a tiny gay bar in Manhattan. Garland would perform a few songs with Struggle for a $100 bill, the only compensation that would be safe from the IRS, who was hounding her for back taxes. She died three months after marrying her fifth husband. In 1966, Mickey Deans was managing a nightclub in New York when he met Garland. A friend asked him to deliver some pills to her in her hotel suite. As Garland's career waned, Deans became one of the many men who tried to save her and restart it 
though most gave up due to her erratic behavior and drug use. Before proposing to the actress in 1969, Deans, who was 10 years Garland's junior, dated her occasionally for a number of years. They were married in London on March 15, 1969. Judy commented at the time about the marriage. I finally got the right man to ask me. I've been waiting for a long time. Deans discovered 47-year-old Garland dead in their bathroom on June 22, 1969. A coroner ruled her death an accidental overdose of barbiturates. Despite her very public fall from grace, Garland's viewing in New York City was attended by 20,000 people. She was eulogized by how a star is born co-star James Mason, and her star-studded funeral was a sad affair honoring a great talent who was never really able to grow up.